It is yourself. No course? Uh, it's far too mild for a coat. There'll be rain later. Well, I'll bring it with me when I go back to the station. I'll come with you. No, Marie. Let you stay here with your mother. I'll come with you. I'm calling for groceries at Union Quay in case Keating is coming with me. Is that a fact? What time will you be leaving? Ten to six. Well, it's three o'clock now. I'm going to the Timmins' house. I'll be back on time, I promise. Goodbye, Gerline. The world is upside down. I never thought I'd need my daughter to walk me to work. Because I'm supposed to be protecting her, not the other way around. These last few years have stained my uniform. And not just with blood, but with anger. I used to be the policeman. Now, people see me as the enemy. I'm from the Kingdom of Kerry, and I'm in the Royal Irish Constabulary. I grew up on a small farm with a big family just outside Carrasavine. The farm was on a hillside, so it wasn't prized land. But we were good tenants, and we kept sheep. Our land meant we were educated well. And so all my brothers and sisters have esteemed jobs. There are several girls in America. One of them is a nun. Uh, we have a nurse. Uh, I had a brother, a doctor, who sadly died. And there's a brother, a priest. This all meant I was to become a policeman. It wasn't uncommon at the time to join the RIC. In fact, in Kerry, almost every house had a son or a brother in the force. It was a respected job, which required discipline and moderation. At that time there was about 11,000 men police in the country, with the exception of Dublin who had their own police force. Here back then, there was little talk of rebellion, and when there was, it was quiet. I'm told there was a Fenian rising in 1867. A group of Fenians robbed a man's house, stole his horses, and then killed a policeman. I rest his soul. Life was strangely simple back then. Now there's bombs and spies and assassins. The rebels today are intelligent and passionate. They have ambition and hope. As a policeman, one has to be prepared to lose one's life for the greater good. question we have to ask ourselves is, am I fighting for a cause worth dying for? So, when I was 24, I joined the RSE. I served in many counties across Ireland until I was finally stationed in Cork City. I've seen many towns parishes, and even cities across the Emerald Isle, but none of them compare to my home or the Lee. Apart from, of course, the whole kingdom of Kerry. <laughs> the barracks are on Tucky Street in the flat of the city. There is plenty of Kerry in my barracks, and we all feel at home here in Cork. Last year, after 21 years of service, I was promoted to sergeant. It was a great honour, and I'm still proud. There's talks of a promotion in the barracks at the moment, and I'm keen to get it. Head Constable James O'Donnell. Sounds good, doesn't it? I bet the pension is even nicer. Right, that kind of my 
Marie could continue her schooling, and so could the other three. They wouldn't have to be policemen or rebels. They could be whatever they choose to be. But these titles, sergeant, head constable, come with their fair share of responsibilities. Fifteen years ago, I married Margaret, the love of my life. We moved into this very flat here in Tower Street, just a ten minutes walk from the barracks. There's a few other policemen living nearby with their families, and so the children grew up together. They spent hours laughing and chatting, inventing games and playing tricks. There's my sweetheart now. Uh, what did they say at the station? The promotion will either go to me or another sergeant. But I was told that if I keep my head down and arrive on time, I'll have it in the bag. Oh my goodness, a head constable in the family. What an achievement, my dear. Yeah, we must not get ahead of ourselves. The other candidate is held in very high esteem. Hey, can you not reward yourself any praise? A head constable? Yes, well. The job comes with much more than the title, you know. Well, no, if it's too dangerous, you must refuse it. My dear, I haven't got the job yet. You mustn't worry yourself. I'm here with you. Everything is all right. Marie is walking with you this evening. He is indeed. Thank God. Good. My guardian angel. Oh, she said she'd collect the provisions as well. What are we walking on now, dear? Mm. A scarf for you. Sure, it's getting fierce cold. And I need you to keep well. I'm a lucky man. That is you to look after me. Well, somebody has to. <laughs> <laughs> Did you hear anything about Nora Murphy? Sure, it's nearly a month since Joe died on hunger strike. Well, I don't know the family personally. But from what I've heard, they're all in an office state. I love them. But sure, it was a tragic way to go. And I'm glad Arthur Griffith called the strike off. Sure, they were only torturing themselves. Yeah, they were torturing themselves to achieve their goals. In a way, you have to admire that. It's sacrifice. I can't admire anyone who sacrifices their own life. Do they not think about their families? I'm sure they do. But just not for the sake of themselves. This was the sake of their beliefs. Don't you start talking like that. I can't have you on a hunger strike. Don't worry, darling. I could never pass up wood bacon and cabbage. <laughs> Is that the time? Oh, I must go to the seamstress. Off with you, so. These days, it seems everyone is fighting. 17-year-olds, 25-year-olds, 70-year-olds, God help us. <laughs> mm. At the beginning of 1920, Cork became a battlefield. But the RIC was just a local police force. Made up of men like myself, Irish Catholics, earning a living. But because of our image, after the 1916 Rising, we had very low recruitment rates. The area were clever and well trained, which meant fighting against them very difficult. Our constables were not trained or equipped to fight against these boys. And so, they are aided most of the fighting, and the RIC did most of the dying. And of course, the rebels don't wear uniforms, which makes them as good as invisible when they're walking the streets. Thankfully, a special reserve was deployed in March. Many of these men were veterans of the Great War, and so had mismatched uniforms. And because of this, the local people started to call them the Black and Tans. They became known for their brutal reprisals and public terror. There were even rumours floating around the barracks 
that these lads were criminals sent over here to Ireland in exchange for a shorter sentence. I don't know myself. But there's a pub right beside the barracks. And some of the tans have made themselves at home in there. I spent many nights trying to break up brawls and drunken fights. They can be wild and ruthless, and I wouldn't want to be on the wrong side of them. After the rising, I thought it was all over. No more fighting, no more death. But the fighting had only just started. I could sense the anger in the streets. You could hear the people's thirst for freedom. In a strange way, it made me proud to be Irish. And it made me fear for my life. With good reason. In March this year, the RSC did something dreadful. I'm not proud of it. And I often wonder how different our lives might be today if that night had never happened. On the 20th of March, in the early hours of the morning, the Royal Irish Constabulary raided the McCurtain residence in Blackpool, the home of the Lord Mayor, Thomas McCurtain. They killed the man in his own home, in front of his family, on his 36th birthday. Of course, that wasn't the end of that tale. In my opinion, when the RIC killed McCurtain, they started the war. Because after one attack came a reprisal, and after that came another. It was a never-ending cycle, with both sides too proud to call in it. Sergeant Garvey was also a Kerryman. In May, he was shot leaving his barracks. He took four bullets, but he was dead on the scene. And the gunman disappeared into the night like it was nothing. You see, Garvey had a hand in the killing of McCurtain, and so he was being watched. He had a target on his back. We all do. These days, just wearing this uniform makes me a target. That's why Margaret is so worried. But I keep telling her I'll retire early, and we live well. When Garvey died, his eight children were left without a father, and his poor wife without a husband. He was buried after, down in Killarney. I wonder where I'd be buried. In Caris I've been, when I'm old and grey and have stories to tell. To be one smashing wake. By the summer, morale was low on the barracks. Felt like we were losing every battle we fought. We underestimated the IRA. They were strong and well equipped. That's when the auxiliaries arrived. The oxies are tough, but they don't act like policemen, and so the people have no respect for them. They are feared for being violent to civilians, and so they feel powerful. But fear isn't a power, it's a target. Would you credit this? In July, Lieutenant Colonel Gerald Smith made a speech to a group of RSC men. In it he said, the more you shoot, the better I will like you. Twelve policemen resigned and joined the IRA when they heard that and small blame to them. What is like that? Make me wonder if I'm on the right side of this battle at all. I contend that if I was born 20 years later, I'd be a rebel. And by the same token, 
If any IRA combatant was born 20 years earlier, they would be sitting in my uniform right now. But that's not the way God intended it. And so I'm the man in the uniform and they're the ones fighting for freedom. In summer, the constables were given rifles, grenades and machine guns. I don't carry a weapon. But there's many that do and don't make great use of them. One evening last October, I was at the barracks ready to return home when a lad arrived and told us of a commotion on Patrick Street. Two drunken oxies were taunted by a group of Irishmen and so they opened fire on the civilians. We arrived just in time to find two wounded civilians and two very drunk policemen. As sergeant, of course, I tried to discipline them, but wasting my breath. That's the trouble with the auxiliaries. They aren't disciplined, and so they can't be trusted. Oh, where's that daughter of mine? She said she'd be here to walk with me. She hasn't returned since this afternoon. Well, you must wait for her. I can't, Maggie. I'll be late to the barracks. I told you I have to be on time. James. 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 I don't like the look of that sky. Be careful, James. It's been one week, one week without him. When I come back in the afternoons, his chair is empty, his cup is cold. It all happened so fast I can hardly piece this week together. When he left the house, he walked along White Street as he always does. There, two rebels were waiting. It wasn't supposed to be, Dad. He was just at the wrong place at the wrong time. He was shot three times. That night, my mother was convinced he was only wounded. Don't worry, my dears. He'd wake up in the morning. I knew he had left us. I could feel it. We prayed all night, and in the morning when the news was delivered, my mother was overcome. I never saw my father again. Mammy begged the other officers not to reprise, but they didn't listen to her. Three men were shot and two men were killed that night. It was vile. My father would not have wanted that. He would have wanted forgiveness, but he won't get that at all. The rebels have delivered an apology letter. They said that they didn't see my father as a threat and that the attack was not sanctioned. They even said that they respected dad and were sorry for our loss. But I can't accept that apology. He would want me to, but I can't. Not now. Not when my mother is in this state. She's not mom anymore.
but without him, she's only half the person. My father was a good man. He didn't hate the rebels and he didn't worship the British. When people asked him what side he was on, he would always say he was an Irishman. And he was an Irishman. I wondered if my father admired the rebels in their fight for freedom. He wasn't carrying a gun that night. He never did. It made him feel like the enemy and, and he wasn't. Ten minutes for someone to report the murder. Ten minutes. His body was lying on the dirty street for ten minutes before someone finally decided to call a doctor. I mean, were people scared of what the rebels would say if God forbid they helped a policeman? The man was suffering. They just stepped over him like he wasn't even there. That uniform. That uniform changed the way people looked at him. It was disgraceful. I lie in bed. My mind begins to run. If I had been there with him, would he have been shot? Would we both have been shot? Would it have made any difference at all? I had arrived when I was supposed to. Would that be alive? Did my mistake cost me my dad's life? Or did it simply save my own? Will mom blame me? Dad, if you're listening, I'm so sorry. And take care of us. I'll miss you forever, Dad. <laughs>